Chapter 3. Esther 3, 1 to 15. Haman, advanced by the king, and despised by Mordecai, seeks revenge on all the Jews. 1. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman. Set his seat above all the princes, that is, raise him to the rank of vizier, or prime confidential minister, whose pre eminence in office and power appeared in the elevated state chair appropriated to that supreme functionary. Such a distinction in seats was counted of vast importance in the formal court of Persia. 2. All the king's servants, that were in the king's gate, bowed, and reverenced Herman, large mansions in the east are entered by a spacious vestibule, or gateway, along the sides of which visitors sit, and are received by the master of the house, for none, except the nearest relatives or special friends, are admitted farther. Though the officers of the ancient king of Persia waited till they were called, and did her obeisance to the all-powerful minister of the day. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, the obsequious homage of prostration not entirely foreign to the manners of the East, had not been claimed by form of his ears, but this minion required that all subordinate officers of the court should bow before him with their faces to the earth. But to Mordecai, it seemed that such an attitude of profound reverence was due only to God. Herman being an Amalekite, one of a doomed and accursed race, was, doubtless, another element in the refusal, and on learning that the recusant was a Jew, whose nonconformity was grounded on religious scruples, the magnitude of the affront appeared so much the greater, as the example of Mordecai would be imitated by all his compatriots. Had the homage been a simple token of civil respect, Mordecai would not have refused it, but the Persian kings demanded a sort of adoration, which, it is well known, even the Greeks reckoned it degradation to express as Xerxes, in the height of his favoritism, had commanded the same honours to be given to the minister as to himself, this was the ground of Mordecai's refusal. 7. In the first month. They cast per, that is, the lot, in resorting to this method of ascertaining the most auspicious day for putting his atrocious scheme into execution, Herman acted as the kings and nobles of Persia have always done never engaging in any enterprise without consulting the astrologers, and being satisfied as to the lucky hour. Vowing revenge but scorning to lay hands on a single victim, he meditated the extirpation of the whole Jewish race, who, he knew, were sworn enemies of his countrymen, and by artfully representing them as a people who were aliens in manners and habits, and enemies to the rest of his subjects, he procured the king's sanction of the intended massacre. One motive which he used in urging his point was addressed to the king's cupidity. Fearing lest his master might object that the extermination of a numerous body of his subjects would seriously depress the public revenue, Herman promised to make up the loss. 9. I will pay ten thousand talents of silver. Into the king's treasuries, this sum, reckoning by the Babylonish talent, will be about two million one hundred and nineteen thousand pounds, but estimated according to the Jewish talent, it will considerably exceed three million pounds, an immense contribution to be made out of a private fortune. But classic history makes mention of several persons whose resources seem almost incredible. 10. The king took his ring from his hand, and gave it unto Herman, there was a seal or signet in the ring. The bestowment of the ring, with the king's name and that of his kingdom engraven on it, was given with much ceremony, and it was equivalent to putting the sign manual to a royal edict. 12 to 15. Then were the king's scribes called. And there was written, the government secretaries were employed in making out the proclamation authorizing a universal massacre of the Jews on one day. It was translated into the dialects of all the people throughout the vast empire, and swift messengers were sent to carry it into all the provinces. On the day appointed, all Jews were to be put to death and their property confiscated, doubtless, the means by which Herman hoped to pay his stipulated tribute into the royal treasury. To us it appears unaccountable how any sane monarch could have given his consent to the extirpation of a numerous class of his subjects. But such acts of frenzied barbarity have, alas, 
been not rarely authorized by careless and voluptuous despots, who have allowed their ears to be engrossed and their policy directed by haughty and selfish minions, who had their own passions to gratify, their own ends to serve. 15. The king and Herman sat down to drink, but the city Shushan was perplexed, the completeness of the word, painting in this verse is exquisite. The historian, by a simple stroke, has drawn a graphic picture of an oriental despot, wallowing with his favorite in sensual enjoyments, while his tyrannical cruelties were rending the hearts and homes of thousands of his subjects.